All right, we are getting started. Welcome to everybody who is tuning in for another EBFA webinar. Very special welcome to those who are return listeners. We greatly appreciate your support. And if this is your first time tuning into an EBFA webinar or any of our education, welcome. And we hope to see you on future webinars and trainings. Before we jump into today's webinar, a few housekeeping or business matters is that we will be running through approximately, let's say 30 minutes of education, followed by Q&A. So if you have any questions for our educator, you may type those in in the questions tab of the control panel. If you scroll down, you'll see the questions tab. Just type those in throughout the webinar and we'll make sure that we go over those. If for some reason your question is not answered, we will have our educator's contact information available so that you can reach out to him. All of our webinars are recorded. They are found on the EBFA YouTube channel, which is youtube.com backslash EBFA fitness. You will be able to find this webinar as well as probably a hundred or over a hundred other webinars and other content. So please do check out our YouTube channel. This webinar, just like all the other webinars, were part of the Barefoot Strong Summit series. For those who have tuned in to all six webinars, we are choosing a professional to attend the Barefoot Strong Summit for free. So hopefully you are someone who listened to all six webinars. Tonight's webinar is one that is also in conjunction with a new course that we are teaching through EBFA. I will let our educator introduce that. Our educator today speaking on the male pelvic floor is the EBFA Global Director of Education, Dr. Federico Luzzi. Welcome, Dr. Oh, welcome, Dr. Emily. Thank you so much for having me. Of course. So I'm going to let Dr. Luzzi introduce himself and jump into some really uh, exciting content. I know everyone got excited when they saw that there is a course and a webinar focused on male pelvic floor, where most of it focuses on female pelvic floor. Enjoy. Well, thank you so much. I'm very excited to be here talking about this topic today because uh, 15 years from now, 15 years ago, I was focusing my uh, job that uh, I'm in a medical doctor and a doctor of osteopathy, and now I'm a student of physiotherapy, so I'm focused on, on therapy, let's say. I was helping uh, both male, male and female to have a more uh, together with a gynecologist and a, and a mental therapist to have a more pleasant sexual life. And we, we were dealing with infertility and we were dealing with all the uh, issues that are regarding the pelvis, let's say. So today I'm talking about this and especially the male pelvic floor because female pelvic floor has had uh, a, a, a huge light on it due to the work of Arnold Kegel, who was a gynecologist back in the 60s and 50s and 60s that has discovered some exercises to help all the females that have hypotonus, so no, not enough tonus in the muscle, in the muscle tone of the pelvis of the pelvic floor, but male has have not too much uh, focusing on their problem. And researching male and female pelvic floor dysfunction, we have discovered that they, are, they have different dysfunctions, but statistically they have the same problems. So it's not it's common to, have, to think about the pelvic floor and think about the female pelvic floor dysfunctions, but male pelvic floor dysfunctions are equally statistically um, important. So uh, we are, going in two weeks into this magnificent summit that is going to talk about the brain awakening so all the connection between our life our movement and the brain and in the second day we will talk about the pelvic floor uh, we will have um, very amazing speakers so if you cannot be here be there you can attend online and if you enter the code webinar you can spare fifty dollars and it, it, the, the barefoot training summit is something that when you attend it you have 
you are different in, in morning morning it was for me as an attendee and attendee in the last few years and now i have the privilege to speak about my my topic uh, we have created together with dr emily the pelvic balance seminars we would in this seminar this is a one day seminar we will talk about the uh, female pelvic floor dysfunction anatomy physiology neurophysiology and the male pelvic floor uh, anatomy physiology and pathologies and and the, the comparison between the different anatomies and the different way to look at the issues that are not become pathology so we are the ebfa and the ebfa stands for evidence-based fitness academy so we do everything that it's already researched we based our education on science and not on opinions let's say so um i have the privilege of represent all the master trainers of the ebfa globally and we have uh, something that uh, dr emily has created on the foot and we have also the pelvic balance seminars in the years to come so to fully appreciate appreciate the uh, all the function of the pelvic floor we have to look at how the pelvic floor is made so understanding the anatomy and the physiology is is very important and necessary to address and assess all the problems before they become pathologies when you think about the pelvic floor you have to think about what is the function of the pelvic floor and some of that some of the function are uh, very easy to understand and the other maybe will surprise you of course the pelvic floor is the the name itself it's uh, telling everything so it's a floor so it it's in the bottom of the pelvis so that's why we call it floor and it up above that we have the pelvic organs so it suspends all the pelvic organs and for uh, male they have the urinary bladder the prostate and the rectum it controls erection we have we will see tonight that we have different layers in the pelvic floor and the superficial layers made by the bulbospongiosum and bulbocavernosus muscles it can control the erection the erection is something that it's regarding the hydraulic system of the body of course but together with the action of the muscle the blood will can keep on stay in the corpus cavernosum and to have uh, a more rigid erection it produce it produces and controls the ejaculation when you are reaching the maximal pleasure you can control the, the time when you can explore this maximal pleasure with these same muscles so, so controlling and knowing how these muscles are made and the function of the muscle is very important to have a, a pleasant very pleasant healthy sexual life it controls the intra pelvic pressure we will see that the pressure in some part of the body is tolerate well tolerated and in other part of the body is not well tolerated it controls of course mention and defecation we mention and defecation are something that is regarding the autonomic nervous system but we can decide when it's appropriate to let go out of the body some uh, product of, of our metabolism it and something that you may have not think about uh, in the past is that is that the pelvic floor actually transmits the forces from the ground up so it's an important relay station where we can have the force transmission from the foot to the other part of the body especially the core and even the hands when you are lifting throwing or catching something so um 
we need to have a focus on the terminology of this region of the body. With pelvic floor, we actually are talking about a confined structure that is not just muscles, but it's the bony, uh, all the bones that are in the pelvis and even the connective tissue. So all the fascia regarding the area of the pelvis, we call it pelvic floor. Pelvic floor muscle or PFM refers just to the muscular layer of the pelvic floor. We will see that we have another, uh, some other uh, words that are describing this uh, magnificent region. There are pelvic diaphragm or perineum. We will see in a few seconds where is appropriate to refer to some part of the body as pelvic um, floor or uh, pelvic diaphragm or perineum. So the anatomy of the pelvis is very fascinating and easy to understand. We have a pelvis that is way different from the other mammals because we are the only mammal that is bipedal. So to accept this transition from the quadruped position to the bipedal position, the pelvis has had a small change on itself. So it's, it's smaller than our um, cousin primates. So the other ape have a, a bigger pelvis that has more rigid at muscle muscular attachments and have longer uh, hip extensors to explode and, and explore more fast movements. We have this pelvis because we were, we are very efficient walkers. To have an efficient walking, we need the connective tissue structure, the fascia compounds to be elastic, enough elastic to store the energy and to release the energy. So to have, to spare the metabolic uh, expenditure for, for locomotion. So the uh, human pelvis is made by these three bones, so ilium, ischium, and pubis. And we have a false pelvis that is above the pelvic rim, and we have the true pelvis that is below the pelvic rim. So in the, we, when you think about the uh, uh, hip joint, you have to think about that the acetabulum is made by ilium, ischium, and pubis, all the three bones that are it's uh, actually uh, making the pelvis are making the acetabulum. When we uh, think about all the, all the musculoskeletal system, we always refer to some part of the spine as kyphosis or lordosis. And one part that is common in these uh, two different regions is that kyphosis are protecting something. So the occipital kyphosis is protecting the central nervous system. The thoracic kyphosis is protecting the heart, the thymus, the lungs, the liver, the stomach, uh, and all the, uh, the even the, the uh, visceral organs. And in the, the sacral uh, kyphosis is protecting the reproductive organs. One common part, one thing that it's common in this kyphosis is that, that the, the kyphosis is they are not allowing an increase of pressure. If you increase pressure in the skull, you will end up by dying. If you increase pressure in the thoracic, uh, in the thorax, you will die. If you increase the pressure in the pelvis, you will not give life. So uh, it's very important for the body to, to keep the pressure steady, to have um, a very balanced uh, way of dealing with pressure. And we know that we have some muscle that is always creating pressure down, that is the diaphragm. So in order to breathe, we have to lower down the, the chapel or, or the, the shape, the dome of the diaphragm in order to make the oxygen in, go into the lungs. And if you press down this diaphragm, then you press down all the visceral organs of the abdomen. And if we are not very, very, very uh, precisely balanced between the 
thoracic diaphragm and the pelvic diaphragm, this will increase the pelvis pressure, the pelvic pressure. And going directly into the uh, shape and, and composition of the pelvis, we, we see now that in the male, we miss one organ, of course, that is the uterus, but we have urinary bladder, the prostate and the rectum. The, um, in the female, the uterus is in this position here. So you have all the pressure that is coming from above from the breathing patterns that as is going down. And as we breathe in, we have to relax or the body has to relax the pelvic diaphragm, the pelvic uh, region in order to keep the pelvic pressure steady. We will see in a few minutes that it, this is, we, we, this is uh, very important to have a healthy pelvic floor region. So we have all the pelvic floor muscle here and we have all the organs that are suspended just like an amok above all these muscular fascial, mus myofascial um, region, myofascial hammock. It, this um, pelvic floor muscles are divided into three layers. We have the superficial or caudal one that is called the superficial perineal pouch. We have the intermediate. So in the superficial or caudal, so the more prone, or the more proximal to the feet, we have all the uh, superficial muscles. So the muscle that we were talking about in the beginning, so bubo spongiosus, bubo cavernosum, and all the handle sphincters. This uh, layer of muscle is controlling mention defecation, and this is controlling also erection and ejaculation. The intermediate layer is the urogenital diaphragm. It's, a, it's, always, it's only in the uh, anterior part of the pelvis. You can imagine the pelvis as a clock or as a rhomboid structure. So we have the anterior triangle that is made by this intermediate uh, layer and it's mostly a fascial layer so when this intermediate layer is tense the hiatus are closed so all the sphincters are all this this intermediate layer is helping the sphincters to control mention and defecation to control the letting go uh, phase and, or function of the pelvis and to uh, help controlling it without consuming too much energy. The most deep layer or the cranial one, so the more proximal to the head is the pelvic, the actual pelvic diaphragm. The pelvic diaphragm is made by um, the levator ani muscles. The levator ani muscles are the puborectalis, ilio, and ischiocochilial muscles. So third layer, three muscles. Some you will find in, in some textbook that the coccygeal, coccygeous muscle is uh, part of this deep cranial. But if you see the anatomy, the coccygeal muscle together with the piriformis, it's forming the posterior wall of the pelvis and not just the floor. And also for neurological reason, uh, we, we prefer to uh, let out of the pelvic diaphragm the coccygeous muscle. This um, deep and profound uh, layer is made by the levator ani. Levator mean, in Latin means elevate, to elevate. So, uh, the superficial or caudal is uh, made by a shape of an eight in the female pelvic floor. And we will see in a few seconds how it's made in the male. So it's more like uh, narrowing the space between the pubis bone and the sacrum. So it's trying to get the, the, the two bones closer. The uh, intermediate is 
enhancing the tension and the deep and profound layer is trying to lift up something. So lift up the anus. This uh, more profound region or more profound muscle is very hugely fascially, uh, anatomically and neurologically connected with the ex external rotators of the hip. If you see here, this is the coccygeal muscle. You will see it's originating from pubis and it's getting all this way down to the coccyx, coccyx. But this is the iliococcygeal muscle. It's originating in the obturator membrane right from the uh, same membrane that is covering the obturator's internal muscle. So we, when you pull down this muscle, you will try it with this pontum fixum on the obturator's internal, you will actually enhancing the tonicity and the, or the activation of the uh, active uh, hip stabilizers. So we have a profound connection between the hip and the pelvic floor. And what, what Kegel was missing, God bless Kegel, but what Kegel was missing was this connection between the pelvic floor and the hip. So if you have to get rid of some tension in the pelvic floor because it's too much uh, hypertonic, then if you not deal with the internal rotation of the hip, so the possibility of internally rotate the hip, then you will miss uh, one part of the rehab, pro rehab process. So to uh, a huge part of our education is to get all the links, all the dots connected together. And this is one of them. So if you deal with uh, pelvic floor dysfunction, you deal with uh, hip dysfunction. And it's not uncommon to have, um, let's say incontinence or urinary incontinence and hip arthritis in the same uh, population. Another connection that is very huge is from, uh, it's with the pelvic floor and the AD doctors. When you, when, if you have uh, dealt with uh, hip arthritis in the past, you will see that you have seen that it, the AD doctors are uh, very strong and tight and even fibrotic in some cases. And this is actually given, giving the pelvic floor uh, tonicity. So if you, one, one uh, very, very important uh, way to look at the pelvic floor is that if you, uh, one kid can stand on one leg, one leg stands at three years of age, when the kid is able to control the sphincters.